time once again for Community Forum, and we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Reverend John Helmier and Chad Goler Sojourner. Reverend John Helmier is the convening minister at Valley and Mountain, a new church community in South Seattle, and the executive director of the Hillman City Collaboratory, a social change incubator. Chad Goler Sojourner is a Seattle-based writer, storyteller, solo performer, and recipient of a Distinguished Washington State Arts Commission Performing Arts Fellowship. John and Chad, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thanks for having us. So let's start out with Chad. You were the organizer uh, two weeks ago, February 7th, of a march, uh, for lack of a better title, talk called Walking While Black that uh, related to the the arrest and, and video release of uh, Mr. Wingate. Can you talk about your motivation in putting that together? Yeah, well, like most people, I saw the article in The Stranger and saw the video, and I was um, immediately just heartbroken. Um, so a lot of my work, my work both as a writer and a performer, looks at the issue of race and policing, um, I'm the adopted child of white parents. I grew up in a white neighborhood, went to white schools, didn't really have a black friend until college. And so I was always protected under what I call this um, honorary white suburban privilege. So I interacted with police as, with police as white suburban kids did. Um, and so I know that's not the way the police interact. And so to be an adult and to see like, you know, suddenly I'm an adult black male and therefore I'm inherently dangerous and Therefore, you know, by that, everything I carry is dangerous. This is a man who walks 10 miles a day, um, and he was using a putter as a, as a cane. Um, my father had a stroke in 79 when I was eight years old, and never once has anybody ever thought his cane was a weapon. And so when I saw that, I was just heartbroken. And then I was more heartbroken when I saw how that played out. Um, you know, there was no discernment. So you have this first officer who would later find out as racism and was posting racist things. Um, but then you have this other officer who comes on scene and in classic Seattle racism addresses the elderly black guy, sir, and then puts him in handcuffs. And then they go back to the station where one or two other officers co-sign it. And so suddenly he's in jail. This is a 69 year old black man who came through Jim Crow segregation was in the, I believe the air force for 30 years drove a bus for 69, you know, salt of the earth, you couldn't find a better person. And now it's sudden, at 69, he's in the back of a paddy wagon and spending his first night in jail. It just broke my heart. Um, and so I said, we, got, we have to do something to keep the awareness because um, people will, you know, spin and the story is already being spun. So that morning, Sean Whitcomb, I believe is his name, who's their spokesperson, you know, said, hey, we investigated it. We don't think it was race. We think if it was a white guy, the same thing would have happened. Excuse me. And then later that evening, we get those text screens from uh, the officer. And then where was Shaw? I'm like, hello, Shaw. Where were you, Shaw? Come, you know, where, you know, four hours ago, you know, where's your retraction? There was not, you know. She's on leave. And I think it's important because um, one of the things about those communities is they like seem really concerned. We're going to investigate. We have no idea what that, what that means. People go away. Um, and this is also a case that the city attorney got and charged him and by their own admission charged him based only on what the police report said, which is interesting. I was a paralegal for 15 years. I'm, that's not due diligence. I mean, the city attorney works with the police, but they're not the same organization. So here you had a racist cop who had nothing but contempt for black men. And there was nobody stopped. There was no discernment. Nobody stopped it all the way in. And then the city wants it. They want an award because they apologized and gave his, his golf club back. Excuse me. So you organized the, the march uh, after. Yeah, uh, because I'm sorry, but I didn't even answer the original question. Um, so I saw all that, and I, said we, I organized the march for a couple reasons. One, to um, 
keep it so people will keep talking about it to the so the absurdity of it. I wanted to put a face to it. Um, you know, the police are not the only people who believe that black people are inherently dangerous. I mean, that's not something exclusive to the police. I wanted people to see this man, to meet him, to come out and see his story and to begin to question not only his story, but this happens all the time. As I said, had that been a 22 year old black kid, we would have had a very different conversation. I also want people to know that is it likely that maybe there's other people in jail, black men in jail, who did nothing, but also just got passed along, passed along? I mean, I personally, I would love to see all of her arrest records. I mean, I don't think that's too much. I would love to see all of her arrest records, what they were arrested, who the city or district attorney was, like how it mattered. Um, you know, we have this justice department oversight, but like, that's kind of oversight. I mean, the fact that that you said this, that you did this, because um, it's, it's, it's a truth or a lie. He either did it or he didn't. If we believe he didn't, that means she perjured and like filed a, f a false report, which any of us would probably, we could go to jail for. So that's the first issue. You know, she just gets fired, she's lucky. Um, and based on that report, everybody did things. And so that wouldn't be the first time that happened. So we did it to do that. We also did it to bring awareness to the fact that this is systemic, it's not just her. It's much bigger than her. Um, that was the same week of the other guy in the East Precinct came out with his Facebook page that also had, well, actually, he offended everybody. I mean, he just had this pair. It was a brilliant paragraph. I mean, like, one paragraph, he, like, took everybody down. Um, yeah, so that's basically why we did it. And, you know, we had a lot of different kinds of people there, which was good. Yeah, it was, it was a powerful march. I, I was able to make it. And um, to see Mr. Wingate stand up and and give a speech, uh, you know, as as an activist, I've seen a lot of, People give speeches impassioned and um, sharing the big ideas uh, and analyses of the world. Mr. Wingate was just standing there saying, I don't know. I still don't know what's going on. I still don't know why this happened. This doesn't make any sense. Months later, um, he's there just completely bamboozled by the situation. When you see him in the video sitting in the back of, um, of the paddy wagon of, of the police van, uh, it is heartbreaking. So beyond just heart. I, his, yeah, every time I saw that, I thought of like, Martin in that Birmingham jail, and I, and I mean literally, I just saw this man um, who was just out for a walk. I mean, part, one of the fundamental things about being American is movement, and he, this his movement was restricted because he was black, and he met this cop, and they, there was this intersection, and um, yeah, it was heartbreaking. Even when, if you look at the video of him at the march, he's like, "I didn't do it." He still feels the need that he need. We know you didn't do it, but you still feel the need that you have to say that. Because and nobody believed you, but we believe you. He was justifying it, saying, I, I don't have any beef with the police department, uh, so why would I be swinging a club at them? Yeah, he's, he's needing to say that, even though it's on video. The video, uh, thank God for the video, that it exonerated him. I, I remember when the story came out, because um, I, I heard about it from Don Mason, who's an elder in the uh, Rainier Valley kind of neighborhood, um, and a mentor of mine. And she, uh, she, she let folks know, and I remember reading the story in the media, and it said, you know, an officer spotted a man swinging a golf club, banging a sign, and she had to stop him. He, he was a dangerous person. Thank God we have this video um, that shows what really went on. Otherwise, maybe nothing would have happened. And so when we talk about systemic failures, the officer wasn't disciplined until not only the video came out, but then there was a public outcry, and, and there was, you know, an organized response to that from the people. So... Um, what is heartening to see is that when people do cry out, when people do organize together, that actual uh, change begins to get made. But the, the, the failures are still systemic. And, um, you know, if we want to talk about OPA, the Office of, of Professional Accountability, uh, for the police department, which is supposed to be the, the oversight body, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, and Chief O'Toole has begun making some of those changes, but the statistics are still mind-bogglingly bad for that. For that department. Um, I, I actually added up the numbers the other day. They've published these reports from 2006 till 2012 um, that show how many uh, complaints were brought to the police um, that people showed up for, so they dismiss all the ones that people don't show up for, which is a lot because people have to go to the police department <laughs> to tell the police department that the police department hurt them, which is a ludicrous thing to do. Um, but uh, they finally moved OPA out of that police headquarters somewhere else just recently, which is, which is a, a great win. Um, but still, 
so they published these numbers, and and I looked at the use of force cases, and they didn't put this straight out there, so I had to do some math. Um, but uh, only one percent of use of force claims c- complaints um, in those twenty two thousand six to twenty twelve. Uh, that were brought, only 1% of those were actually found sustained. So they're saying 99 out of 100 people who are saying that there's excessive use of force, this is this is what OPA is basically saying, uh, are making it up. Well, I mean, it, I think it's part of, you know, it's who's wa- who watches the watchers. I mean, I think it's silly. Um, you know, I'll say, I mean, I, look, one of the things about racism when you're growing up with white families, I mean, by eighth grade, I could tell you 25 different types of racism, actually, right, could write a book on it. Um, I think I know about racists is when racists don't like other racists, depending on what kind of racist you are. And if you're racist enough to put stuff on your Facebook page with your government name, that's what I call front street racism. And that only works if you're friends with other racist people. So that would never work on my page because my, my people aren't like that. Um, and so the fact, you know, so the fact that she put that out there, I mean, cops have cops friends and later we, so we saw that. And so I don't believe you. And this is part of me why, my work is kind of limited in this arena because I decided a long time ago, I'm not just going to play your game. So if we're going to have a conversation. You don't get to decide when we enter. So I want to talk about the issue of this woman who'd been with the police department since 97 and our, and had posted these racist things. And I know that's not her first time. And I know people, and she rests as a man and boom, 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 boom here. You want to talk, hey, we're sorry, we gave you your club back. Keep the club. You know, the, the action was done. I mean, right now, just yesterday, I believe, um, the chief um, gave out the new um, social media policy, which is, a, which is the silliest thing I've heard. I mean, I don't care what your social media, I don't care if you're a racist, that's not the problem. There's certain people who shouldn't be racist, cops and teachers and a couple other people. You know, as I said at the march, if you're putting racist stuff on your page at eight o'clock at night, you're going to be racist at eight in the morning. You know, racism is not like a crock pot. You don't get to turn it off. <laughs> and somehow I think they're like, hey, so it's not about your social media policy. It's about your racist policy. I don't think, I mean, th- there are a lot of non-racist people, you know, who could be cops. So the fact that we're talking about these racist cops as if we need them concerns me for a couple of reasons. One. You're also a liar because no cop goes to the you know academy and signs up for the job. You know says, "Hey, I'm a racist." Just by the way, so you got the job under false pretenses. Because I'm not a big fan of an adult onset racism. Kind of happens, but by the time you're adult, you kind of like you like and hate who you hate. Um, so that's my concern. You weren't truthful, and now I have to deal with you because at the end of the day, as um, John and I were talking on the way here, um. I should have the right to call 911 and not be and not worry about who they're sending. Like I hope they don't send that Brian or that Cynthia or that other racist cop. I should also be able to walk down the street and if somebody calls the cop on me, I don't want them to show up cuz that's how people get shot. So personally, I think I need to be accounted for. You know, tell me how does that make sense? How can you guarantee me all the services that I'm entitled to if a racist cop might deliver them. Yeah, the, the, I think um, the city has, has begun uh, thinking through a little bit of this stuff and, and they've begun this micro neighborhoods policing plan where they want to have police assigned to really small neighborhoods and that that actually has some potential um, for good. If, if we get to know in our neighborhoods um, the police officers and they get to know us, but it only works if the officers there are uh, not going to be racist, uh, bringing that kind of prejudice to the table. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't want that to be <laughs> the cop in our neighborhood. How do we change that? That's that's a whole culture change. Um, that is much bigger problem uh, that anybody's got an easy answer for. You know, and the thing about bias, so I've done a lot of work for years out dealing with bias and working with groups of bias. I would say that bias, whatever it is, bias people will get you sick before you get them well. So. You put one racist in a room of 10 people and he will he or she will poison that well before those 10 people make him a non-racist. So that's my concern is that 
you know, some of these people might not be, but suddenly you're, you know, you're telling jokes, you're doing this, you're going out. So, and also if there's no accountability for it, because it's also hard to do that too. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're working, you know, you're my supervisor and we're doing racist jokes and saying all this kind of stuff. And later you have to um, reprimand me for something. Yeah, but you were there too. Mm -hmm. You know, you're part of it. So I have that on you, you know, because you engage in that activity. Um, and I think that's part of with this woman, this um, Whitlatch, Officer Whitlatch, is I think she's been filthy for a really long time. And I think they're really scared of that because she goes down, you know, she, like I, she could take everybody down. I mean, he's been here for like 20 years almost. This is not new. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that's one of their concerns. Um, or they would let her go. I mean, she's just alive. They, if it wasn't, they would just like let her go, you know. Because this is the first time, I would say, this is the first time in the in, in the history of the internet that I've ever saw an incident with a white cop and a black man and like 99% of the people were for the black man. It's never happened in the whole internet. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting calls from all over the country, emails from all over the world, um, mostly from white people. And they're like, what? Like old white people too, you know, even conservative old white people. Uh, I think that scares the city, as it should. And in some ways, it seems to have touched a chord more than the numerous shootings that have happened uh, over the years. I'm sorry? Uh, well, it seems like it's it's resonating with people far more than, let's say, the shootings that have occurred um, that the videos come out with. Well, part of that is just because who he is. As I said, I, I'm a writer. I couldn't craft it a better narrative. You know, week before, we saw the, the, the young man at Yale who was stopped leaving the library. Um, and I get, but my, I always want to remind people that shouldn't be, that's not the benchmark. You know, if, if, if this was a 22 year old kid with priors, it wouldn't have changed the fact if you're walking, you were walking. So I think we need to remember the next time it is a young black man or even a black man who's been in jail with the law before, that doesn't mean everything you do is going to follow that. It's still, you're still going to do. And so we need to look at the facts. You know, why would they be doing this? What was going on? You know, some investigation discernment. And we need to go, even if we're not invited to that, we have to say, wait a second, because as, as long as they lead the, the narrative, we will skip past all this stuff. Like all the like, the sort of like questioning, like why did this happen? And why, you know, this happened? And, you know, we need to go back and pull back. Like, for instance, in my play and the work I do, my question is always, you know, why do so many unarmed black men go reaching for weapons? I mean, that's what the claim, I mean, I have, I mean, you know if you have a weapon, okay? So mm -hmm. why would you reach for it? Secondly, if that's the number one reason given by police for shooting down on black men is that they're reaching towards the waistband, like what black men in their right or wrong mind would be reaching anywhere near that area in the presence of law enforcement? It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't pass the, the smell test. Um, this whole thing, aggressive stance, menacing look. Tar I mean, what, that, those are what what does that mean like you know because we we should know that like i you know we need to know you need to be able to describe that you know i felt threatened if you look at her police report which is really important because she said all those same things i felt threatened i had to stay back you know so it's like a textbook i mean i don't think it the day of the academy or the day they get caught but it, all the same thing all across the country so i'm reaching for something menacing threatened safety um and there's one other and and i gotta say they work so i'm not you know it's not you know whatever you're doing is working we have to question that as citizens is that enough do we get to say hey i need some more mm -hmm. or hey i noticed that happens a lot so i i noticed that a lot of you know mm -hmm. a lot of people are shooting unarmed people because they thought they were reaching something for their waistband um do we need to recalibrate do we need to send you back to the academy um, so you can actually see better. And I don't mean that like, you know, mockingly, but if you shoot an unarmed person, it means you failed because you saw something or thought something was there that wasn't. So the fact is we're failing and we should, we should look at like, how is that happening? And what can we do to, um, to not fail as much? Yeah, there's just, there's an enormous lack of accountability. Um, and, and I would hope that police officers would want more of that. I, I, I can't understand how, if, if you are a professional doing your job well and correctly, um, day in and day out, you wouldn't want an accountability structure. 
Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor, and uh, there's pastors who, who mess up out there and who need to be held accountable. And uh, we've got some mechanisms in place to do that. And, and I want those to be there. And I, w- I would want those to, to catch me if I was doing something wrong. Um, I, I'm not asking for um, some kind of blankets. Um, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, um, um, you know, in, in, your, in your workplace environment, you've, you've got to have some kind of um, structure that keeps everybody safe. And accountability should do that. And so um, we've really got to find a different way to to get some of these officers who are, who are doing this off the streets to, to kind of build back up the reputation of the police department. Definitely. Um, and the thing accountability is, um, you know, people hate what I'm, what I'm going to say. People hate it, but I'm going to say it anyway. So during my, when I was a paralegal, one of my jobs, one of my work, I worked for a law firm that um, was a defense attorney for the um, archdiocese. Um, and so... I had to look through all those files and papers, and a couple of things I learned, setting aside the actual abuse, which is horrific enough, what was even more horrific was the system that all worked under. And I can tell you that the system of the Catholic Church and the system of police is the exact same system. We're inve- no accountability, we're investigating, we'll move them on, it's exact to the T of how this happens. And so we ask, well, why? well because, I mean, why? You have to, why would somebody go in to report the police at an officer, I mean, at an office there? I mean, you have to sign your name, like what, what sense does that make? Mm-hmm. Um, I see you only did one out of 99, why would he even complain? Mm-hmm. You know, I just mm-hmm. saw, I saw the video and you said there was nothing happened. What happened to me wasn't even that bad. So part of that is just this whole thing about like just the silence. We're going to move on. We're going to do better. You haven't done better. So you've not done better. You know, this is not better. And I think what happens is sometimes Seattle thinks we're better than some other place else. So we're not Mississippi. We're not Alabama. Um, although um, I tour a lot in the South, and it's always interesting um, because people think Seattle racism is so much better. Um, I think if you ask most black people, we'd take a cup of Southern racism over this kind of racism, because at least you know what you're getting there. Um, and so I just think that's something we need to look at here in Seattle is mm-hmm. accountability. Um, and we're not trying to tie your hands. You can still do your job, but you know, excuse me, like, how do you do that? And if you can't, do we need different people? I've always said the number one problem with policing is who we recruit. You know, I lived in New York for years and at that time, you didn't really go to college. You basically had to be 18 years old. And so there were all these like white kids from Long Island whose dad were cops or played football. who never met a black person off of a football field. And it was, you know, so if you're just getting military people or people who are violent people who you know, come from that violent background or the aggressive background, that's going to follow you into the policing. And we see that all the time. And um, there's no de- de-escalation. It's like, what? You know, People get punched first. Yeah, and I mean, even if even if people have deep questions or they're not motivated by uh, the social justice reasons for accountability, there's an economic reason too. I mean, we've seen William Wingate's got a lawsuit. Uh, Jesse Hagopian, um, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but um, man uh, who gave a speech on Black Lives Matter and then um, like an hour later was pepper sprayed while he was walking, minding his own business. That video is out there. Well. Um, I filed a lawsuit against the city. I, I was beaten up a few years ago during an Occupy protest. Um, I, I went through the OPA process, so I know it very well. It uh, felt like a complete sham to me. I mean, here I am. It's it's on video. My face is fine. Um, I'm getting pulled down by an officer. Um, I'm, I'm shouting. I'm a man of peace. I'm on the ground. I get punched in the face several times. Um, and then there's pictures uh, in the mug shots of me because I was taken the police station and arrested where my face is messed up it's pretty simple there there's not a lot of gray area there and opa found it um uh inconclusive that was that was the report so i came in i told my story they said we'll look into it six months later i get an, uh, a letter saying inconclusive they say it takes up to six months to to investigate their claims the average amount of time they spend is 170 something days so they take all all those six months to try to let the, the thing blow over and and then you get a letter saying inconclusive or unfounded. And that's kind of sad. I mean, look, you know, if you can be on video, if you can punch 
a white man of the cloth and not be found, you know, be sanctioned. What about the, you know, the 20 year old black kid again? So I just think that it's such an interesting thing. And these offices and all these kumbayas that we want to do, these meetings, well, stop having meetings. Just do. You already know what to do. I'll give you a list. Hire me as a consultant. I'll fix you in one day. I'll give you a list that we'll walk through. Mm-hmm. And as you've pointed out, it's it's systemic, though. It isn't just the police department. The prosecutor's office has got the same oh, problem. Oh, just, sin- just sinful, you know. Um, in terms, we call it missing the mark. And Seattle has really missed the mark on lots of that stuff. And they want to do the more kumbaya. And like I said, I don't really care. I mean... You know, I think you need to look, let's tackle racist cops because it's not freedom of speech. You know, you have to be able to serve everybody. You can't have bias as a cop. If you do, and I understand some will happen, get a, you know, in-house therapist. I mean, I totally get that a job can jade you. I'm not saying that, you know, you know I, I totally understand that, but you have to work on that. If not, it's time to get a desk job or to move on. I think we've got to make sure, too, that as we talk about these racist cops these individuals that that it's it is bigger than that you know as a pastor i am for reconciliation and i believe that in each person there is a goodness that and some it's hibernating deeper than others but that that can come out but the issues here isn't just between an individual and an officer there's also this whole system that's at play um that i think we really need to see some reform and in my tradition the the christian tradition the prophetic tradition um it's Part of reconciliation, part of, part of moving forward and forgiveness is is protest, is naming the truth, is confronting the reality of um, injustice. And until we do that, we can't get anywhere towards reconciliation. So there's this desire in the department um, and in the city at large that just wants to move on from things and just say, "Oh, this bad thing happened. Sorry. Let's let's go forward and and you know let bygones be bygones." But until we kind of get to the heart of of the kind of at yeah. heart of darkness and call it out, um, we can't actually move it's forward. It's comfortable. I mean, nobody wants to sit in it. You know, let's move on. Let's have a meeting. Bring the mayor out. We'll have kumbaya. And I look, I love kumbaya. I'm not making fun of that. Song, but there is the need to like, well, let's address this. You can't move on if the same thing's going to happen. I mean, we need to do. And so it's like, it's accumulative too. So. Yeah. There, and there's some, there's uh, some actual things that can be done out here. And, you know, for for one, I would start with Reverend Harriet Walden, uh, Mother's Police Accountability, um, who has a whole list of reforms out there that could make a real difference. So these problems are huge. They can feel exhausting and impossible, but there are things we can do to move forward. And she's been doing her work for at least 20 years here in yeah, Seattle. 20 years. So, well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. So I want to thank you both very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Um, any website you want to point people to? Just Harriet's site, Mothers for Police Accountability. Mothers for Police Accountability is a good one. Um, uh, tableturning.org um, is a website uh, that is trying to help organize faith communities to um, stand up against uh, systemic injustices um, in a table-turning uh, sort of subversive tradition um that my church comes from so yeah. all right well i want to thank you both very much for coming and spending time with us this morning thank you as well yeah thanks mike